I, I've been asked to, to uh, talk about some trends in risk assessment, the larger world of risk assessment, and how they might have some value as we think about increasingly complex problems related to food and human health. And they are getting more complex over time, no doubt. And so we need better tools to look at them. Uh, so to talk about that possible, those kinds of uses, I've kind of freed myself from any constraints having to do with current thinking about uh, decisions in this area, uh, regulatory requirements, uh, legislative requirements, institutional uh, situations, even scientific constraints. So I've tried to make, the th make all this as easy as possible for myself to, to convey some basic ideas about risk assessment and as you will see in the decision process. Uh, the emphasis here in my talk, drawing upon some other scholarly works and some work from the National Academy of Sciences in particular, is about increasing the utility of risk assessment for very complicated decisions and what we need to do that. And that's the approach uh, I will take here today with some specific emphasis on food and food ingredients. Uh, I'm also going to throw in a few heretical ideas, if you don't mind. I think I have the freedom to do that. I'm not even sure I believe them myself, but maybe uh, they, the idea is to provoke some discussion, perhaps, about how we might be moving into the future. I guess I have a disclosure here to make. Uh, as you heard, the firm I work for does a lot of consulting, although not, nothing in the nutrition area. I've been around a lot of nutrition scientists, but I am not a nutrition scientist. Uh, but I, there's no compensation for this particular presentation. Uh, this is the uh, sort of a broad outline of my presentation. <clears throat> Talk about some sort of a high level view of the problem, uh, some key premises that guide what I'm going to say here that you may or may not agree with. Uh, talk about current decision models uh, and um, uh, their limitations, a new framework for decision making, which you've heard a little bit about. I'm going to expand upon that a little bit. A uh, problem of uncertainty, which I could spend the whole lecture on, something given much, much too little attention in this whole area. The RDA, the DRI process, as a kind of what we call a trade-off of risk, and then some ultimate conclusions. I will say that <clears throat> here, just let me say as a, as a prefatory remark, I'm going to be talking about decisions. And institutions, uh, my recommendation is that all institutions that are making decisions about food and how it may affect health uh, might value, might gain from using the framework I'm going to kind of outline for you. So whether it's a regulatory agency, public health agencies making recommendation, dietary recommendations, or industry uh, making decisions about new food products. It's a useful framework to guide thinking about how to be sure the risk, whatever risk is associated uh, with, the, with the, the, is being managed properly. So that's sort of the emphasis throughout here. Um, let me just put out my, one of my favorite charts about uh, food itself. This is uh, no surprise to anybody in this audience, but uh, food of course is as, con it is more complex environment uh, by far than any other part, any other part of the environment to which we're continuous, continuously exposed. It has massive numbers of constituents, even some contaminants that we have to deal with. We hardly ever think about food in its entirety, and I do believe we need to begin moving more fully to thinking about food in its entirety. I will say this is about both risk and benefit, I will talk about benefit. Here I'm talking only about health, health risk and health benefit, not other kinds of benefits. And I, one thing, my, my one conjecture I have that I, I think many here might agree with is in the first category here, the natural constituents of food, which include nutrients, whatever they are, Chris, uh, and non-nutritive uh, constituents, the largest class my conjecture is that we will, in the future, find more risk and more benefit among these constituents of food than we now realize, by far. And we're going to have to deal with that. Uh, that may not be true, but that is my, uh, I have a, I think there's a good reason to believe that. The rest are things added to food. We've got contaminants as well to deal with dietary supplements and so forth. So it's a massive, a, a truly massive potential problem to think about. We can't really think about the whole thing. My premises here is that 
as we begin to think about managing risks from um, food in order to maximize public health protection or to improve the public health, ideally, you're going to increasingly require integration of knowledge across these various uh, areas of diet as a whole and the constituents and contaminants of food. The application of the risk assessment to this knowledge within a systematic decision framework. The decision framework is very important, and that's what I will emphasize. It provides the best basis for improving public health. And health risks, I will argue health risks and health benefits, I think this is basically not different from what, what we just heard from Dr. Blumberg. They can be analyzed within the same analytic framework, the same risk assessment framework. In one case, we're talking about increased risks. In other cases, we're talking about reduced risks. Reduced risks is synonymous, I think, with benefit. And then the final, thing, final point is that decisions that seek to maximize net risks to health, where, where this is applicable, where you have competing risks and benefits. I think there are a lot of such cases. Decisions should aim to, to maximize or minimize net risks to health. So that's a key premise in everything I will say. Uh, the, the 1983 Red Book framework is perfectly sound. Uh, remember, it is a framework for analyzing data, and I think it, it can be applied in any risk situation, whether you're talking about individual constituents of food or contaminants or even diet as a whole. That framework applies. Uh, that, that's the goal. I think you all know that. The purpose of risk assessment, there are two main purposes. And now I'm in the institutional context. Uh, people like Dr. Wu and Carl King can do all the risk assessments they want. They're in an academic setting. But I'm talking about risk assessment in an institutional setting, government, industry, where decisions are going to be made about human health protection. The only real purpose to do a risk, for doing a risk assessment is to make good decisions. So risk assessments must, must be uh, fashioned in a way to, to ensure they achieve that desired effect. They're also useful for identifying research needs. This is not something we think about a lot, but it's very, what better way than to analyze what you know and what you don't know than to figure out what you really need to know by, through research. I will make the point, the second bullet from the bottom there, risk assessment does not create knowledge. That's only from research. Knowledge comes only from research. Risk assessment has the value that it tells you how best to analyze what you do know, how to treat what you don't know so well, and to come up with a useful product for decisions. But it doesn't create new knowledge. So if we're going to get uh, better information about ULs, it's not going to come from risk assessment. It's going to come from research. Uh, it, so it's systematic, that's, and it forces you to be systematic and explicit about everything you do. Let me say a, a little bit about current decision-making models. Uh, I, have, uh, I have this term, bright line decision models, and they're, they're sort of models, you've heard of uh, several of them referred to here today, where we, we talk about levels either above or below some bright line and one acceptable, one unacceptable. Those of us who do risk assessment know that these are not truly bright lines, but they are certainly treated that way in decision making. Uh, and they're, they're sort of simply described as distinctions between safe and unsafe level. Their derivation is said to be a purely scientific activity. You will see that I think that's not correct. I will come back to that point. <clears throat> that is it, they should not be seen that way. There are some limitations to these models, serious limitations to the models. They, they may be perfectly fine for decisions about, say, substances like additives or pesticides where there's a pre-market approval, and you're going to draw a bright line, and you must not exceed that if you want an approval for a product. That's fine for many additives. Uh, I will have the following criticism about that, though. These bright lines are not risk-free. No one can claim we know them to be risk-free, but we've spent zero time on trying to describe what risk there is at those bright lines. I will come back to that point because I think we can do better on that point. And finally, wherever there are trade-offs, I use the term risk-risk trade-off where you're, you're having 
in, you're faced with a decision where there's going to be some risk of doing one thing, some risk of not doing it. How do you trade off between the two? Bright line models are not useful for that purpose because they have no flexibility. It's like there's one definition of safe and only one definition of safe. I think that's not a useful kind of tool. Then there are many decisions, particularly as, as, as we deal with food contaminants, and there are other areas as well where there are serious technological limitations to what we can do. So there's always going to be some risk trade-off with some technological limitation. You don't like to think about that because one has to do with health, but on the other hand, you can't really avoid it. This comes up a lot at EPA, and there are some decisions uh, in food of that nature. So moving away from bright line models, I would say, is uh, something that we need to try to work on. <clears throat> the carcinogen model is not a bright line model. Keep that in mind. It just, you may not think much about low-dose extrapolation and models for cancer risk assessment, but they do describe risk as a function of exposure. They, you can set some very low risk level, my second bullet point there, as a bright line for some decisions, 10 to the minus sixth lifetime risk for some decisions about carcinogens is a bright line. But there are many decisions where you could, uh, there's maybe a range of very low risk that you would be satisfied with in any particular setting. So they are, they are ideal for the kind of decision making I'm talking about with possible trade-offs. So I'm sorry, I'm getting a little hoarse. <clears throat> this book came out 25 years. I've got 2009 here. It actually came out in 08. It's 25 years after the Red Book. I served on both of the committees, the Red Book Committee and this one, having to do with risk assessment. I recommend this one for those really interested in this topic. <clears throat> it's about advancing risk assessment but it's also about decisions. It's very importantly about decisions. Uh, the Red Book model sort of very clearly set up a, a framework for risk assessment, distinguished it from the management process, but it didn't really talk about how best to use the results in decision making. So this book does a lot to remedy that, and I will go through that in a, just sort of a light sketch of what this, this uh, science and decision says <clears throat> about decision-making. There's a lot else in here of great value, I think, having to do with the carrying out risk assessment, cumulative risk, the use of defaults. All of this uh, can be of great benefit, and I recommend this very, it's very thick, I must say, very thick book, but it's pretty uh, well organized and, and I still think reader-friendly. One thing I will mention here, this has been the most controversial part, of the science and decisions uh, <clears throat> recommendation uh, is a move toward unification of dose response analysis, whether for threshold or non-threshold agents, to get to a better description of how risk of, of effect changes with dose, moving away from bright line models, if you like, or if you have bright line models, you specify risk-specific doses to define those bright lines. They are no longer just sort of qualitative uh, values as we now use them. Uh, this is not something readily uh, available to us today, but there's a lot of research going on, a lot of uh, work going on to try to move in this direction so that we're talking truly about risk, whether for thresholds or non-threshold agents. We're talking about risk, not bright line models. That's one recommendation out of the Silver Book. Now this one, is the important one for today. I'm not going to walk through every step of this, but I, I promise you, uh, you, you, you may think what I'm going to describe is kind of obvious, uh, and may, I hope it sounds obvious at least as a kind of way to approach this, but you will find, and our committee found, that it's not really very often done in a rigorous way. And we ought to begin thinking about how to where risk assessment appears in the process of getting to a decision. And it's not the first step. This is a, a broad, this is the a broad picture of the steps described in the Silver Book. I recommend anybody who's in this process at all spending some time with this. It's, it's not really hard to follow. 
but it's, a, it's, I think, very, very good guidance. I'm going to give you, as I said, a sketch. I won't walk through this complicated figure. One thing I won't mention further here that's at the bottom of this figure is that there's a strong emphasis. Through the, you notice there are, there are three phases here. I will go through those phases uh, very briefly. But in all phases, the committee recommended that stakeholders, internal and external stakeholders, be involved in the process. So their risk managers, the risk assessors themselves, and other interested parties. And I would say that that ought to hold whether you're a government agency or an industrial organization working through this. Get other input into the process to increase its credibility. Let me just give you, uh, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to use a term here that is used throughout the Silver Book. It is not intervention in the way that many nutrition scientists are talking about it here. Here I'm talking about actions whether <clears throat> any action intended to alter human intake of one or more constituents or contaminants of food, alter intake, or actions intended even to alter overall patterns of food consumption. Those we would call interventions in a different sense than I, I've heard it here today. But, but these interventions in the Silver Book context are called risk management options. And the whole thrust of the Silver Book is to get stakeholders, managers, assessors together first to think about risk management options before doing any risk assessment. So phase one, problem formulation as it's called, the, that, that phase is not about saying we need a risk assessment on fumonacin. Did I say that right? Fumonison? Fumonison. That's not, that's not a phase one problem formulation question. Phase one problem formulation is what is the problem you're trying to solve, the overall problem. So here I put a decision context, it's just abstract, but here we want to, the question would be what, what actions should we take to provide protection of consumers from Fumonisin in, what is it, corn or whatever it is, uh, or any other contaminant of food. That would be the context. That's where you begin, and that, those questions should be formulated very clearly in advance and understood by everybody as the questions. If you don't, if you don't do that early, as has often happened in the past, we have lots of documentation for this. The last thing any institution wants to do is set risk assessors to work doing risk assessments without this context. I've done it myself. It is a very dangerous and stupid thing to do. Because risk assessments, they like to have fun with assessments. There's no focus on what is really useful for the problem at hand. So here you define what, what interventions are to be considered. If you're going to all, you have some existing condition you think is a problem, what's the range of interventions to solve the problem, and then what assessments do we need to do to evaluate those options, and then are there other, are there types of technical assessments? Here with contamination, you may need to understand more about what is technically achievable as well. That ought to be part of a decision. Then you go to the design and conduct of risk assessment phase two to look at the specific risk questions that need to be answered in the risk assessment process done by risk assessors. One point I will emphasize here is that when we think of an intervention to reduce risk, we should, that would, what I call in, is it number two, the direct effect of the intervention, we should also be thinking about indirect effects. Uh, there's a famous scholar of risk analysis, Wildowski, who argued with quite uh, good evidence that we hardly ever take an action to reduce risk without something else happening that may increase risk. Sort of, we're blind to it often. Or there may be even other things happening to reduce other risks that we're not aware of. So we may be getting, in any circumstance, more benefit or less, more benefit than we thought we might if we don't consider these other indirect actions. Or we might be getting less risk reduction than we think we are. So always something to bring into the equation. And then you b look at the sort of net effect of all of that. And then you turn that over to the manager. 
and given the comparative health benefits of the proposed in interventions, that is reduced risks, how, which one should you select? You've got to be completely clear about how you do that and <clears throat> about how you consider uncertainties in the process. Uh, I have a, one slide on uncertainty. I, won't, I don't have time to deal with it. This is, this, is a, this is a very important IOM report from last year on uncertainty in risk assessment and its use in decisions. It is something we don't do very well at all. Everyone is nervous about uncertainty. But <laughs> uh, Richard Feynman said, uh, he said, and this is uh, quite wise, that um, it's better to live with uncertainty than to have answers that are wrong. And so if, if you're not dealing with uncertainty, you've got answers that are wrong. There's no question, there's no risk assessment ever been done that doesn't have uncertainty. And unless you can describe those well uh, and, you, and then figure out how to use them in decisions in a wise way, that's a big, big challenge that we're not really ready to face yet. And communication, I agree with what Dr. Blumberg said, we're, we're horrible about communi uh, communication. And part of the problem in communication of risk is the uncertainty. We don't know how to talk about it well. So those are, these are terrific challenges. Let me just um, go right to the, this process. This is a little heresy here, but uh, this is a, <clears throat> these are the same curves you looked at earlier, except I've changed them here to imagine a situation in which the dose response curve for excess intersects with and overlaps with the dose response curve for deficiency. Now you might say, well, this is not possible for nutrients, you know, uh, uh, nature would not have done that to us, okay? I, I'm not convinced that that's, this is impossible. Maybe it's rare, but I'm not sure it's impossible, particularly with the minerals that are found as nutrients. Whether this holds for nutrients or not, it's still a problem in other areas where you're getting either uh, competing risks, if you like, that you have to deal with in some way. So imagine this in the nutrient situation. How, the question that you need to ask is, how do we make a decision? The formulation is, how do we make a DRI de decision that leads to the smallest net risk for the population? Hard question. That's sort of the problem formulation. Uh, I just want to say something about the framework for UL development, because it came out of a sort of a different setting and context than the framework for toxicity assessment. Um, the, the, let me just remind you how the, the framework developed for risk assessment for chemical toxicity. It came out of, uh, there was earlier work than the 1983 Red Book, but the Red Book emphasized that there, there was a need in the risk assessment process for standardized default factors, uncertainty factors, standardized dose response models in order to avoid, where, you, where the science was short, where, where, where the science was incomplete, you didn't want to have sort of case-by-case -case manipulation of the assessment. You didn't want judgment to enter um, so that you, you, you get sort of get, you, you get, you end up with the answer you want. The idea was to avoid that. So the only way the committee thought to avoid that was to specify and standardize the default assumptions in the assessment. They ought to rely as much as possible on what science could tell you, but science can't tell you, you know, whether 10, a factor of 10 is enough in most cases. We're gonna use 10, unless there's a good reason not to, but we're gonna use 10 all the time. And that avoids, for a certain, fa for a certain element of the assessment process, sort of adjusting it on a case-by-case -case basis. This, this was developed within regulatory agencies so that those decisions about science and science policy were made in that context. I think in the UL framework development, it was not done in that context. It was done here at the Institute of Medicine. They were all scientists working on this. So there were no sort of risk managers, if you like, having a say in how factors were uh, selected, and in fact, there is still a strong, uh, not, not much enthusiasm at all for using standardized factors in this process. Uh, there's a lot of scientific judgment. 
That's fine, I think, as Chris Taylor said, as long as you say what, what you're doing, but it does lead, possibly, to some arbitrariness in the process. And that, the only way out of that fix that I know of is mode of action studies, something like the ILSI key, re key events framework studies that um, uh, gets you to a more science-based uh, UL. <clears throat> uh, I have a little section here, this is a little bit of heresy, in which I say maybe you could think about the RDA and the UL as not purely scientific, scientifically derived uh, values. Here's where people are going to go nuts. You could, see, you could see the selection of ULs and RDAs, I would argue, as different kinds of interventions and consider a range of possible values for RDAs and ULs that, that are, consider them, as I described earlier, as interventions which are to be analyzed in a risk assessment context. And then the decision about where to set them is then turned over to a risk management entity of some kind, working with the assessor to understand the risk assessment, but trying to get to a decision which puts the RDA and UL in such that you minimize risk, overall net risk to humans. And you might imagine this not only for RDAs and ULs, but for other kinds of situations where you have competing risks or offsetting risks and benefits. Um, you, you, think, you think of the action you're going to take as an intervention, even the establishment of the UL or RDA. Uh, a lot of people will think this is a little nuts, but uh, I, think, I think you could rightly see a UL as a risk management tool and that there ought to be kind of a risk management decision in its selection. So this is my conclusion. Uh, first of all, the role of the risk assessor here is not to make ultimate decisions about how much risk is to be tolerated, that's a very basic principle, or how much benefit is to be sought, but rather to supply assessments to managers and other stakeholders that produce the clearest and most useful information about the risks and benefits of different intervention options. And then, then the manager then would make the decision about the proper option. You would have exceptions to this in situations where the risk management criteria were already well established. For example, in the developing ADIs for pesticides or food additives, you wouldn't tamper with that. Uh, it is a risk management decision, but we've got the criteria, long-standing criteria, you don't want to tamper with that. And then application of the science and decisions framework uh, is the best, or something very close to it at least, is the best opportunity for getting the information need for these more complicated decisions involving risk-risk trade-offs or risk technology trade-offs. Uh, I'll stop there and uh, maybe take, take a question. Okay.